Hello and welcome to um, the, I guess, second video of the uh, hotspot configuration using the EdgeMax and um, Unify hardware from Ubiquity Networks. Uh, in this video we're going to configure an Edge Router Lite for access for a public hotspot um, scenario. Uh, in pretty much any public hotspot you're going to want to enable DHCP to uh, kind of alleviate some of the technical uh, needs of a user to jump on your network. Uh, the good news is, is that the Edge Router Lite has a pretty fancy GUI interface for you to configure uh, what is needed. Uh, as with anything you deploy in the field, the first thing you want to do is download the firmware update. Um, now I've already gotten into the Edge Router Lite I'm using. It is currently running 1.4 and I know there's an update for that. So I'm going to head over to Ubiquity's website over at ubnt.com. I'm going to click on Edge Max and I'm going to click on Edge Max Hardware and then download software. So there is a firmware update, uh, 1.4.1. I'm already under the Edge Max line and have the correct um, model selected. So I'm going to download that and uh, pause the video while that downloads. Alright, so um, the file has downloaded, so now I'm going to head over to uh, log into the router. So basically what I've done is uh, I started up a, a command prompt and started uh, pinging uh, the default IP address of 192.168.11. And I, power, I plugged the power into the edge router light, and then I connected a LAN cable into uh, ETH0 of the edge router light. Uh, that's the interface that the default IP configuration exists on, uh, so at least for the time being, that's how we're going to access the device. Um, so that uh, IP address is pinging, as you can see here. So uh, we're going to head over to that IP address, and the default username is UBNT, uh, password is UBNT. All right, and we're going to pull up system, and we're going to find upgrade system image, and we're going to click upload a file. Uh, I'm going to head and pause the video and upload the file and uh, go from there. So as you can see, the file is uploading. It's a, a rather hefty image. Um, I want to say it was 60 some odd megabytes, 68.49 megabytes. Uh, but all things considered, that's a full Linux <coughs> uh, operating system that runs on there, I believe. Uh, I'm not sure. You'd have, probably have to check with them. But all things considered, almost 70 megabytes, not that bad for a full operating system. And once this is done uploading... Okay, I apologize. It must have been doing some sort of uh, check on the image. Uh, after some time, this came up and uh, says that I have to reboot. So it doesn't automatically update. Um, it'll check the image to make sure the, I'm guessing the MD5 passes, and then you just have to click reboot. And yes, I'm sure. Okay, so the router is fully booted up. Um, I'd say it took maybe, oh, 90 seconds from the point I told it to reboot to uh, come back online. Okay, so it came back up from factory default, and as soon as I logged in, it punches me right into the Wizards tab, which uh, seems more familiar to me. So maybe I had uh, toyed around with that uh, with this particular router before. So I'm going to open this up now. Uh, you have your your three interfaces basically laid out right here in front of you, um, and you could configure all independent of one another. So the wizard, by default, as you just saw um, before I factory defaulted, will set up um, your, your primary LAN port on ETH0, which is one I'm plugged into right now, uh, your internet port for ETH1, and uh, your optional secondary LAN port for ETH2. 
So basically the way this lays out is ETH0 would be where you plug in your internal network. You'd plug your internet connection into ETH1 and then you'd plug your guest network into ETH2. So I'm going to go ahead and apply this configuration. And it's going to take uh, a minute and probably time out um, because I don't have anything plugged into uh, the internet port currently and I believe it does some sort of a check for an internet connection. And indeed, uh, that is the case. The wizard will fail if you don't have seemingly an internet connection uh, available on ETH1. Okay, so now we have um, our local primary internal network set up for ETH0, and you can run a cable out from ETH0 into a switch and hook up your internal network as you see fit. Um, and then we have Local 2, which will be your guest network, and we can even rename that uh, to guest. And it will apply. So, by default, using the wizard, you now have a, uh, a DHCP network enabled on that ETH2 interface. So let's click on that guy. By default, it, uh, it sets you up for 220 leases. That's quite a bit of leases. But technically speaking, it could go up to um, 253 total supported guests because of this slash 24 uh, subnet. Uh, so if you needed more than that, not to mention uh, that your lease time plays into account here as well, uh, 86,400 seconds so even if a user logs in for uh, just a few seconds they have that lease for that amount of time so if you need more than that you may need to adjust um, the gateway or the IP that you've assigned to that interface uh, to be larger such as a slash 23 or, or slash 22 um, uh, I'm not going to get too deep into that but then you'd also have to change the DHCP server as well so it's one thing to take into account. We're just going to assume that we're not going to be supporting more than 220 uh, users. Uh, as a side note to that, also, uh, let's say you were setting this up in a restaurant or a fast food location, and um, 86,400 seconds is a little excessive for a DHCP lease. You know, someone's going to come in and... Um, you know they're only going to be there for maybe what maximum of an hour if their kids are playing in the in the play place or whatever um, so you could shorten that up uh, pretty significantly uh, you could even go as low as, as 600 seconds which would be 10 minutes um, so I don't know everything's relative let's go 1800 and that'll be a ha that'll be a half hour so as people drop off and their lease expires more you know another user can use that IP address so we're gonna go ahead and hit save on that and we'll leave the the one for the local or the internal um, network alone odds are you're not going to have as much fluctuation on that side of DHCP as you would for the guest network uh, so a good bulk of the work has been done for us already um, the only other thing you may want to do is set up uh, your firewall so what you want to do is you want to add rule set and say protect LAN and stop guest network from accessing LAN I don't know if it's going to take one that long and uh, our default action is going to be dropped and it's up to you whether or not you want to log it or not um, that's purely preferential and then I'm going to save it then we're going to go in and say edit rule set and we're going to add a new rule and we're going to say inform because that's the port that we want to forward uh, the inform port is TCP port 80 80 that's 8080 um, you could also allow 8443 through uh, the problem with doing so is that that gives your guests access to log into the unify controller like this um, so I'm gonna forego that option and I'm going to continue on with my inform and I'm going to say accept because I want to allow port 8080 the inform and uh, select TCP and then we're going to go to destination 
and specify the Unify controller IP address, which I haven't set up yet. We'll be doing that in a later video. But let's just say for the purposes of this video that um, the address is 1.2 slash 24 and we're going to specify port 8080 and we're going to double check that it says accept which it does and we're going to save alright so now we have that set up to accept port 8080 and we're going to say interfaces um, since local or the LAN side our internal side is on ETH0 uh, we're going to specify a direction of in on that interface and then we're going to save it. So now um, the default action is drop. So in the firewall rules basically what it's saying is if I don't if this packet if this piece of information doesn't match this rule I'm going to fall back to my default action of drop the packet and as with all firewall rules it's processed in in order um, so this will get processed first then it'll fall back to this then it'll fall back to that as you can see the interfaces vary so um, by default it anything coming in to ETH0 uh, only this rule will process uh, one other thing to note and I probably should have said it earlier is that when we ran the wizard uh, it also created the NAT rule uh, to masquerade all the private networks uh, through to ETH1, which is our internet rule, and masquerade is uh, synonymous with natting. So we have our firewall policies in place. We have our DHCP in place for both the internal network and uh, the guest network. Um, so at this point, the router configuration is done. If you like, you could uh, plug a plug your internet connection in at this point and uh, plug a computer into the LAN, verify internet connectivity, and um, all of all whatever you need to do to verify connectivity. Uh, the main thing is to make sure the DHCP is enabled on both interfaces, or as needed, I should say. Um, another thing to note is that if you need any special configuration for your internet, such as PPPoE, um, or a static IP address, or, or uh, IPv6, you're going to want to look into um, doing that through an alternative method. Uh, let me check the wizards here. There is no PPPoE wizard, um, and I don't think. Oh, okay. When you ran through the wizard, you would have had the option for PPPoE. I apologize. I should have mentioned that. Um, obviously, set that to whatever your internet connection is. Uh, so if you've already reached this point, you were configuring along with me. Uh, go ahead and reset to default configuration and set that up appropriately. Most are going to be DHCP, so I just kind of defaulted to that. So, like I say, the router is done. Um, you can pretty much put this in place, test, verify connectivity. You could even plug a computer into ETH2 and verify that you get a 2.x address um, and can also get online. So, in the uh, next video, we're going to go over the controller installation of Unify 3.0 on a Ubuntu server 64-bit uh, 12.04 LTS instance. Um, at the time of this video, Unify 3.0 is uh, in the release candidate stage, I believe. And um, you don't have to install it on Ubuntu. Uh, I just picked that one because in the grand scheme of things, it's probably the most complex. Uh, they do offer um, the .pkg file on their website as well as a .exe and uh, a dot the image file for Mac OS X is escaping me at the moment but uh, essentially you can install it on various different Linux distributions Windows and Mac OS X hey guys this is kind of an afterthought um, but I'm working on possibility getting into uh, monetizing the YouTube videos trying to get more out there so if uh, you know the videos are helping you out or you think it's a cool concept or something like that uh, I'd appreciate a like share comment uh, whatever the case may be thanks